as we go through the sermon. But we look forward to what it is to gather together this morning in worship. I want to go ahead and encourage you that should at any point in our service you have a little bit of trouble with our streaming service, know that there are other options. You can switch to Facebook or YouTube in addition to our website, but please take the time to just try again in another way and just keep worshiping with us. Hopefully by now you have already received a communication from the church that has given you an update about what our Bible studies will look like for the weeks ahead. Starting this morning, we as a church have moved into a church-wide Bible study by an individual by the name of Chip Ingram, and it's a video series that you will find on our website geared towards all ages. You will find an adult, a student, and a children's option, and we want to encourage you to begin this study with us as a church at which we look at the seven attributes of God together as a church body. Also, if your Bible study is doing one of our quarterly curriculums that we use with Lifeway, maybe it's Explore the Bible or the Gospel Project or some of the others, we want you to know that starting this next week, Lifeway has graciously offered for us to send you all of that material digitally. And so if you are in one of those Bible studies that's using that curriculum, we will start sending you the leader's guide and the participant guide for your study each week so that you can continue on in your study of Romans or whatever study it is that you started in your curriculum. We hope that you will be able to continue. Now, the most important part about Bible study is that we continue to not only study God's Word, but that we connect in community with one another as we do it. And so we encourage you to send a note to your leaders. Let them know that you're moving forward in your study or send a note to someone else in your class talking about that particular week's lesson. However you do it, we just encourage you not to forsake that opportunity of connecting together in community as you study God's Word. Also, just as another note, I want you to know that as we continue to move forward, our church offices will remain closed. However, if you've already done, which many of you have, you'll notice that we do have a phone number that you can call and reach uh, one of our staff members. That phone number is monitored throughout the week, and it has been a pleasure for me to get to answer the phone and hear from many of you and to meet some of your needs. And so let me encourage you to know that you can continue to reach out to our staff. You can email us as well as give us a call, and we will do our best to continue to serve your family and meet any needs that arise in the coming weeks. We are so glad that you're here, and I hope that you have come this morning prepared to worship, because we are prepared to gather together in one voice and as one church body, giving all glory and honor unto the Lord. So, let's prepare our hearts to worship. Let's begin together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. And Father, why we long to be able to come back together in this place, we recognize that you are bigger than a building. And so, Father, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to worship in this way, to worship through this use of media and technology. And Father, I thank you for the families who are gathering together now all across our community and all across our world, continuing to be faithful together in worship. Father, I pray that you would bless our time as we gather together, that you would move in our hearts as we sing, and you would move in our hearts as we study your word. And most of all, Father, that you would be glorified by our worship this morning. For Father, you are worthy of our worship, and nothing is going to stop us from singing your praises. And so this morning, Father, we come to you humbly, seeking your glory in all the ways of our lives. We ask that you would meet with us now as we come together, because now is the time to worship. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together. Corey? Amen. Good morning. It's good to see you via this unique way this morning. I had uh, many emails from folks over the week as they told me about how they were watching us on Wednesday night and singing with us and worshiping with us. That's awesome. We hope that that will continue. I'd like to read to you from Psalm 92 as we begin today. 
It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the morning and your faithfulness by night. With a ten-string lute, with the harp, with resounding music upon the lyre, for thee, O Lord, thou hast made me glad by what you have done. I will sing for joy at the work of your hands. I like that last part, I will sing for joy. It's not my circumstances that give me a reason to sing. I love this old hymn, there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. His name is what gives us a reason to sing, not our circumstances, for he is good. Join with us as we sing it. He keeps me singing. And there's within my heart a melody, Jesus whispers sweet and low. I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leaves, All across the way Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep See his footprints all the way Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Sweetest name I know Fills my every longing Keeps me singing as I go shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Come, now is the time to worship. Now is the time to give your heart. Now this is unusual, we know that, but don't let anything keep you from raising your hands in worship and your heart and your voice in worship to our God, because now is the time to worship. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give. Just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess, one day every tongue will confess you are God, and one day every knee will bow, but still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly Now is the time to worship, come, now is the time to give your heart, come, just as you are to worship, come, just as you are before your One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you now. So come, now is the time to worship. Come, now is the time. worship the Lord God because he is good.
We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name. See, we're not gathered in the same place, but we're gathered in his name, in one, in unison, to sing praises to him, for he is worthy. Let's sing it together. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our brain. Your presence in this place, your glory on our face, we're looking to the sky. Descending like a cloud, you're standing with us now. Lord, unveil our eyes. You're the reason we're here. Reason we're singing. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Sing that out again. Show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open up the heavens. We want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Open up the heavens, we want to see you open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Oh Lord, may you open up the heavens today and fill every heart with your presence and glory. Amen. I love this song. Actually, Gala is the one that brought it to my attention about mm, a long time ago, six months ago. And by the way, we're, we're happy and thankful that we have the guys and girls up there doing all of the sound and, and the video and everything that has to happen for this to take place. Thank you to them. And uh, thank you, of course, to our leaders up here. We appreciate you very much. Um, it is unusual. I mean, we must be honest. It's unusual. But, but God is not hindered. His spirit is not hindered by whether we're together or not, or video. And so I love this song because it says, Even now, even now, I will trust you and who you are in my life. Come ye weary, come and find your rest in Christ today. And man, if there's somebody out there today that doesn't know Christ, I just don't know how you can walk in peace through such a time as this. You won't know this song, but I pray that your heart will connect to it. I pray that the truth of it will ring true in your heart and mind today. You say, come ye weary. Come and find you. In the arms of mercy, in the one who knows you best, you 
are good, you are good, let my heart remember this, even now you keep your promise, even now your heart is kindness, in the dark I shall not fear, for you are on my side in battle. God, my strength, my shield forever. Where my hope is found, I will pray. Scripture that talks about that. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you may seek refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and stronghold. May we rest under His arms today. Amen. The Lion of Judah, the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world, 
He is Jesus. Sing it with us. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow down. He breaks every chain. And every chain will break. His broken hearts declare His praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion. The Lion of Judah, he's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. Open up the gates, make way. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free for who can stop the lord almighty and our god is the lion the lion of judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb every knee will bow before him who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the lord almighty who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb. The Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, and every knee will bow before Him. We come before the Lion and the Lamb today, raising our hearts in worship. He is worthy of our praise. Amen. We have no reason to fear because Jesus has said, I will be with you till the very end of all that we know. He will walk with us. Sing it together. You hear me when I call. You are my morning star. No darkness fills the night. It cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crushed the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield. No troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? Sing it again. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? For me, I know who stands behind the God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength. 
today. He is with you. We're running a little bit over time, Robert. We're going to do one more. But the God of all creation has promised to never leave us or forsake us. Man, what a great promise. Sing this hymn with me. So come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming And I was lost in utter darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free And now my soul can sing a new song Now my heart has Your grace is always with me, and I'll never be alone. And come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing, come thou fount. Oh, to grace, how 
greater debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a feather bind my wandering heart to thee. I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I Your bride to you we sing. Come, thou fount of our blessing. Come, thou fount, come, thou king. Come, thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride to you we sing. Come, thou fount. my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Amen. Let's pray together. God, may you speak through your word today. May your spirit bring to life the words that we hear today. God, may your presence invade every home that is listening God, and just draw them to you, draw all of us to you today, those of us here in this room and everyone listening all around the world, truly. You are worthy of praise and honor. God, I pray that you would just fill Robert up today with yourself, that you would speak through him in an unmistakably powerful Holy Spirit way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Corey. Corey, I was going to tell you, you know, we don't really have to worry about our time. It's not exactly like we have anywhere to go right now. You know, my father sent me a picture uh, over the weekend, and it was a floor plan of their house, and it showed their living room and their bedroom and their kitchen, and he titled it, My Travel Plans for the Weekend. You know, it certainly has been different, but I want to thank you so much for joining us. Even now, as we have gathered together in worship, many of you have continued to send me pictures and videos of your family worshiping right now with us. And I have to tell you, it's beautiful. I even saw a cat or dog or two in there uh, worshiping with us. And so we are so thankful that your entire family has been able to join us. If you have your Bible, take it and turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 11. You also should have received our worship guide that has that text for you. You're welcome to, to read that and use that as well to take your sermon notes, as it has the text written out for you as well. As we begin, though, can you think with me for a moment? Can you imagine or remember what it is like for a child to first learn to ride a bike? Can you picture that scene with me? Often it is a young child who is decked out in their road gear. They've got their helmet and their elbow pads on. And it's usually under the careful watch and instruction of a parent who will come alongside that child. But perhaps the most key component is that you'll find a small bicycle. And on that bicycle, it has been equipped with the training wheels on either side. Those training wheels serve a key purpose. They are uh, there to give the child the confidence and stability that they need while they learn to ride their bike. The parent will put the child on the bike and then as they learn the basic mechanics of how to ride, those training wheels will ensure that they don't fall to the left or to the right. But there will come a day when that parent believes it is time to take those training wheels off the bike. 
There will come a day when that parent believes that that child has learned the skills that they need. And so they will remove those training wheels and the child will get back on that bike without the aid of those wheels on either side. And maybe with a little bit of fear, but certainly with the knowledge, the parent will encourage and equip that child to now ride without the aid of those wheels. You know, in the church, our buildings, our programs, our activities, all of the things that we do are like training wheels for our faith. They help us grow. They help us gain in wisdom and knowledge. They help us gain the confidence that we need to live out our faith. But there comes a moment at which we should no longer be reliant upon the things of the church, upon the buildings, upon the programs, upon the pastors, and upon the people. There becomes a moment at which the training wheels need to come off and we need to give our faith a ride. I believe that this is a moment at which God has removed the training wheels from your faith. He's taken away all of these things, so to speak, so that you can truly check your faith, so that you can truly trust and test your faith to make sure that you're not trusting upon the programs of the church or the activities or the words of the ministers, but that you are truly trusting in the one and true hope of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is an opportunity for you to ride with confidence and truly ground yourself upon the foundation and confession of our faith that Jesus is the Lord. You know, there is a great paradox in our life. That paradox is that the trying times tend to be the transforming times. The challenging times, just like a child having to learn to ride a bike without their training wheels, going through that struggle and going through that trial will ultimately lead them to the success that they want and that the parent wants for them. We are in a trying time. We are in a challenging time, but believing in the promise of Romans chapter 8 in which it says that God will work for the good of all those who love and trust Him. That God will bring all things together for the good of those who love Him, for our good and for His glory. We are walking through this trying time. We are walking through this challenging time knowing that God is in control with our faith rooted in the confidence that Jesus is our Lord. And I know that the Lord is faithful and that we will come through through this stronger than we were when we began. John chapter 11 contains for us a story about a woman by the name of Martha whose faith is going through a trial, whose faith is put to test at the death of her brother named Lazarus. And it is in this trying time that Jesus not only reveals himself to her and to us, but Jesus moves her to a deeper relationship with himself. And I hope for you and I this morning that as we come to this word, as we look at this trying time, you and I too can move to a greater and deeper understanding that our faith is rooted only in our confession that Jesus is the Lord. So look at this text with me, if you will. Let's begin looking at the scene that is unfolding in John chapter 11, particularly beginning in verse 17. The story begins in this way. It says, Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Pause there with me for a moment. This is quite a lengthy story, but if you go back all the way in the beginning of John chapter 11, word had reached Jesus that Lazarus was sick. And a request had been made that, remade that Jesus would come and be with the family and heal Lazarus while he was sick. But as God had designed, as God had ordained, Jesus did not arrive in Bethany until after Lazarus had died. 
In fact, if you look back in your text, there's a key note in verse 17 in which it said Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Take note of our commentary there telling us that Lazarus has not only been dead, but Lazarus, Lazarus has already been buried in the tomb. And he's already been buried for four days. The number of days, I believe, is significant because, you know, if he had been dead for one day, maybe even if he had been dead for two days, there might have still been hope that maybe he would be healed, or maybe that he would come back to life, that, that maybe he was only sleeping, or maybe he was only in a coma. But for four days, for four days, all hope has now passed. The hope of Lazarus coming back to life for Martha and for Mary has come and gone. And now they're no longer holding out hope as much as they are now grieving the loss of their brother. In fact, later in the story, when Jesus asks that the stone will be rolled away, further on down in verse 38, Jesus says the stone should be rolled away because he's going to call Lazarus to come out. And Martha tries to stop Jesus and says, Lord, please don't, for there will be an odor because his body has already begun to decay. For the scene that is before us is one of great tragedy. It is one of great trial. It is one in which a family and friends are grieving their loss and which the hope has faded. You know, the other day I was cooking dinner in my house. And as you can imagine in my home, I have three small children who right now want to help me with everything. And so I've got three children spread out on the countertops, and I've got several things going on the stove, and I put one of my favorite things in the oven to bake. It was Pillsbury croissant rolls. Don't you love a good, warm croissant roll when it comes out of the oven? And so I had placed these in the oven amongst everything else that is going on in my kitchen. And as I often do, I forgot about the croissant rolls in the oven. And it wasn't until I began to smell this distinctive odor of burnt. It wasn't until suddenly it dawns on me that I had forgotten about the croissant rolls. And as I had feared, I opened up the oven, pulled out the pan, and they had changed colors. In fact, by all estimation, they were inedible. And as I turned to my wife and I looked at her and I said, do you think maybe we can just peel the bottom off and eat the inside? Maybe there's some sort of life and hope still in them. She looked at me and she said, you know what? I think those are beyond hope. That's in fact what they're saying about Lazarus at this point. He has been in the tomb for four days and all hope has passed. They are now grieving the loss of their brother. And you begin to see the scene of desperation. And you begin to hear it in Martha's voice. Look back with me, continuing on in verse 20. It goes on to say that, So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him. But Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Hear the desperation in Martha's voice there in verse 21, in which she says, Lord, if you had been here, Lord, if only you had come sooner, if you had only made it quicker, my brother would not have died. You know, there is something about a tragedy in our lives. There is something about a challenging time in our lives at which we turn to God and which we tend to accuse Him. Or we tend to begin to feel that He has betrayed us. And like Martha, we come to God and we say, God, why did you let this happen? If you had only been here, if you had only been involved, my brother would not have died. Sometimes through the fog of our grief and through our finite ability, we are unable to see the work and the promises of God. And as we read this story, you may be tempted to begin to question Martha's faith. 
In fact, you may have felt like your own faith was in question when you suffered a same tragedy or when you suffered a same trial. But look back at our text, for while I believe Martha's faith may not be perfect, her faith is not gone. Look back as she goes on. She says, Lord, if you had not been here, my brother would not have died. But, but even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. She may be struggling. She may be grieving. But she recognizes the power of Jesus. She recognizes the power of God and she says unto Jesus, I know even now amongst this loss, even now amongst my grief, that whatever you ask of God, He will give you. Your faith may be shaken. But I want to encourage you, as Martha has done, to get to this point at which you can say, but even now. But even amongst this trial, even amongst this loss, I know that you are still Lord. Next, Jesus makes one of those claims. He makes one of those claims that is amazing. If you look in Jesus' reply in our text in verse 23, Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Jesus says to her, Your brother will rise again. Think about that with me for a moment. C.S. Lewis studied the, the words and the life of Jesus very thoroughly. And he presented for you and I what is known as a, a trilemma or a tri-dilemma. In which when we study the life of Jesus and when we study the words of Jesus, there are really only three conclusions we can draw about the things that Jesus said and about the things that Jesus did and about the course and the outcome of his life and his resurrection. He said when you look at the life of Jesus, you can either come to the conclusion that he is a liar. That is to say that everything that he says is not true. That when Jesus says to Martha, your brother will rise again, that he would be lying. Now fortunately we know in our story that he's not lying. But C.S. Lewis goes on to say, okay, if he's not lying, then he has to be crazy. He has to be a lunatic because think about what he is saying. He is making statements and doing things that defy all human nature, that defy all human capacity. And so if he's not lying, then he has to be crazy. He has to be a lunatic. But if he's not lying and he's not a lunatic, then that only leaves one other option. And that is that he is Lord. That is that what he says he has the power to do. That is, that the things he does don't come from powers that exist in this world, but the things that he does come from his relationship with God the Father. That they come from the authority and the power that God has given to him and granted to him. And that makes him Lord. And so Martha replies to Jesus in a way that I think we too all would reply. In verse 24, he, she replies back to him. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus says to her, your brother will rise. And Martha says, of course he will, Jesus. I know that he will rise on the last day. Take a moment and think about what Martha is saying here. Martha is agreeing with Jesus that she believes in a future resurrection. Even as a Jew, they understood that in the last day there would be a resurrection. When she is responding to Jesus, she's saying, Lord, I know that what you are saying is true, and I do believe that my brother will rise. But you know what? Right now, he's still dead. See, Martha has an interesting understanding of the resurrection. She has an understanding that I believe Jesus is about to challenge and an understanding that Jesus is about to reveal to us a revelation about the resurrection and eternal life that is profound, one that is a game changer, 
One that is a promise that not only comforts us, but also gives us hope. And so let's look at what Jesus says to her and says to us. Beginning in verse 25, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Jesus has just revealed to us one of the greatest truths, not only about himself, but also about a promise that he is giving to you and I today. Jesus is making a statement of identity in which he says, I am the resurrection and the life. See, Martha understood the resurrection and eternal life as an event. Martha understood that the resurrection was something that was going to happen. But Jesus looks at her and he says, the resurrection is more than an event. It is more than something that is simply going to happen in the last days. Jesus looks at her and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. It is not an event, it is a person. The resurrection and eternal life is not found in some date and at some point in history. The resurrection is found in the person and the lordship of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say it in the promise and really to confirm for us what he is saying when he says, I am the resurrection and the life. When he says that whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And he goes on and says, everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. The resurrection and eternal life are more than some point in human history. They're more than some point in eternity. Rather, they are the person of Jesus Christ. And all who believe in him, and all who are trusting in him, even those who have died, even those who have gone to sleep, if they are trusting in Jesus and believing in him, the promise is that they will rise. And the promise is that those who live, they too will experience eternal life. Martha may have understood the resurrection as an event, but Jesus shows her that it is a person. But Martha also understood the resurrection as something that was in the future, something that was going to come in the last days. But look back at what Jesus actually said, because what Jesus is presenting to us is that the resurrection and eternal life is not some future reality that our loved ones who have passed are waiting on, or some future reality that we have to wait for, but Jesus is sharing with us that the resurrection and eternal life are now. He goes on and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. When shall he live? Now. Yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Martha was believing that the resurrection was something that was yet to occur. But as Jesus is about to show us in Lazarus, and as Jesus will show us in his own life, death, and resurrection, is that the resurrection and eternal life is something that he is giving unto us now. Isn't that good news to know that someone whom you have loved Someone that you have known who has gone on to be with the Lord is not waiting. But yet they have already experienced the resurrection and they have already experienced eternal life. The great preacher Billy Graham described it this way in which he said that when someone dies it is as if they take their last breath here on earth and their very next breath they take in eternity with God. Isn't that good to know? I don't know about you, but I can't hold my breath very long. 
Probably a few seconds can pass before I need my next breath. And so this image that Billy Graham has given us to really understand Jesus' teaching here brings great comfort to me to know that as I take my last breath here, I'll open and gasp my, my next breath in the presence of God. And what Jesus has done in revealing, to the, us, revealing this to us is he has taken the very thing by which we perhaps fear the most and he has eliminated our concern. And he has said that all who believe in him will have everlasting life. Jesus has revealed to us that the resurrection and eternal life is a person, not just an event, but it's a person and it is a present reality at which we experience that we have the opportunity to come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And then I believe Jesus asked her one of the most important questions. If you look at the tail end of verse 26, Jesus says to her, do you believe this? Do you Believe this. Why is it important that she believes? Well, look back at the promise. The promise is contingent upon belief. If you're going to be a participant in eternal life and the resurrection, then it's contingent upon your belief. It's contingent upon your faith in Jesus. And don't forget the context in which she is being asked this question. She is being asked this question when she has been confronted with the death of her brother. When she is grieving, when she is scared, when she is mourning, when she is challenged, she is being asked, does she believe? You know, I have found in my own life that in the trying times, then some of the most difficult days I have ever faced, I have asked myself this question. There is something powerful about asking this question when life is difficult. There is something transformative, I believe, about asking this question when things aren't business as usual and things aren't rosy. There is power in asking this question in the difficult times. The times when you find yourself sitting along the bedside of a loved one. The times when you find yourself living in the middle of a pandemic. And our health is threatened. Our stability is gone. And the economic viability looks as if it is lost. Jesus asks the question, do you believe? And look at Martha's confession. She says in verse 27, she said to him, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into this world. Can you make that same confession? Her confession is beautiful. It's perfect. Notice that she is confessing that Jesus is the Christ. Remember that Christ was not Jesus' last name, but Christ was Jesus' title. And what she is saying is, yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you are the Messiah. I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you are the Son of God who God promised in Genesis from the foundations of the world. I believe that you are the one whom God has sent to redeem us from our sins and to save us from our sins, who dies for our sins upon the cross and raises to new life. Yes, Lord, I believe. Can you answer that question in these challenging times? Can you answer that question when your loved one has been in the grave for four days? Do you believe?
I want to encourage you to do something, even now, right now. As you gather with your family, I want to encourage you to turn to them right now and say to them, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I want you to turn to them and say, I believe that Jesus is Christ, that He is the Son of God, the One who is coming into this world. I want you to take a moment right now and in the presence of your family and in the presence of your children and in the presence of your loved ones, I want you to reaffirm your belief in Jesus. I want you to take a moment and answer this question. Do you believe? Let your family hear you. Let your spouse hear you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I believe that He is the Son of God. Make that confession today. Because in that confession are the words and the promises of eternal life. More importantly than making that confession to your family, let me encourage you to make that confession to God. The Bible tells us that if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is the Lord, and if we will believe in our heart that God has raised Him from the dead, we will be saved. And it goes on to say that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. It is a promise. And so let me encourage everyone right now to reaffirm your faith in Jesus. To reaffirm that He is Lord of your life. To reaffirm your belief that God has raised Him from the dead. And all of the promises of Scripture are yours. And they are not yours for some future event. They are not yours for some point in human history. They are yours today. They are promises that you will inherit now. Do you believe? It may be an easy question to answer when life is going good and all things are easy. But can you stare our current circumstances in the face and say, even though the world is shaking, I still believe. There is power in that confession. And may we all make that same confession as a church today that we believe Jesus is the Christ, that He is the Son of God, and He is the one who has come into this world. Let's close together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this Word. For it is a Word, Father, that we needed today. And Father, I pray, I pray that You would strengthen our faith for the days that are ahead. And Father, although these are difficult days, although these are trying days, Father, our faith is not shaken. Our faith is built upon the cornerstone of our confession that Jesus is the Christ. And so, Father, our faith is not built upon the buildings. Our faith is not built upon our ministries. Our faith is not built upon a pastor or upon some gathering. But our faith is built only upon Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And we are only trusting in Him today. And so, Father, we are not moved. We are not shaken. But, Father, our feet are firmly planted that You are Lord. Father, thank You for saving us. Thank You for loving us. And thank You for sending Your Son to die upon the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And just as You have raised Him to newness of life, Father, we believe that we too are raised to newness of life with Him in eternity. Thank You, Father. We ask all of this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you made that confession of faith for the first time today, I want to ask you to do something for me. Would you give me a call 
or send me a note, send me an email, robert at peoplesharingjesus.com, and let me know that you made that confession of faith today. I simply want to pray for you, I want to encourage you, and I want to continue to equip you for the days that are ahead. But let us all continue to remain confident that Jesus is Lord. He is the same yesterday, He is the same today, and He will be the same tomorrow. And aren't you glad that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness? Let's close together as we sing a song of benediction. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Oh, how I love Jesus. If you're sitting, you can stand. How about that, wherever you are? Let's sing about our love for him this morning. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. Tonight at 6.30, brother, correct? 6.30, join us right back here this evening for our evening worship service. Hope you will. Have a blessed day.